So welcome everybody to Corinthus First Friday with the Thought Leader. It is August, my friends, and we are raring to go. And with that, as always, we bring up Alexander to do a coherence moment. Yeah, with pleasure. I'm actually gonna throw it back to all of you today and just make a request that each of us takes about a minute, minute and a half to engage in whatever practice works for you to get you present and centered and clear for this first Friday, letting go of what has been this morning and entering into this particular space with presence and engagement. So just take a moment, whatever practice works for you, engage in it now. Okay, take a deep breath, everyone. Feel the shift that deep breath brings. And with that, I'll hand it back. So again, welcome everybody. This is the Corinthus community, global community of professionals advancing team effectiveness. You are here because we know you, you know us. You've either taken one of these programs um, or we've reached out uh, directly we thought you'd be interested in what we have as a community. So it is with great pleasure that um, I introduce you to our thought leader for today, Yotam. Yotam is a Corentus coach and facilitator. He specializes in helping teams and individuals lead from vision, purpose, and passion rather than stress or reactivity. Yotam has worked with leaders at Google, Unilever, Egan Zender, Novartis, AstraZeneca, Accenture, Accenture, and several late stage startups and environmental nonprofits. He brings to his work an integrative and embodied experience in adaptive leadership, semantics, adult development, and immunity to change. Yotam is endlessly curious about the spark of greatness inside each person and how to help it shine brighter. I'm known Yotam for years now. Um, I remember calling Amy Fox from Mobius years ago and said, you know, we could really use some help at Corinthus. You know, who do you recommend? Who's a rock star? She's like, Yotam. So that's how we got connected with Yotam. Um, I think it was like five or something years ago, and it's been a delight to know him ever since. And with that, I bring you Yotam Schenker. Thank you so much. And I'm going to be sharing my slides. So if you'd stop sharing yours. I, I will do that. Over. Absolutely. And I'm here today talking about courageous presence. I've called this the heart of transformational development. It emerges for me from a study over a lot of my life. Formally, I'd say the last 10 years and informally, probably the last 25 or 30 years of this question, how can we be at our best more often? We all have wonderful gifts that we want to give the world. How can we bring those forth more often? And my deep belief, I'm an evangelist for the belief that we are wired for nuance, creativity, connection, and growth. We are wired for exactly these gifts that we want to give the world, but only when we feel safe. So how do we feel safe more often? That's become the driving question. Courageous presence is gonna be a move toward all of us feeling safe more often. And there's an interesting both and here because we can create safety together and team charters and mutual accountability and rules of the road and how we wanna treat each other are a huge piece of psychological safety in teams. And as we all know on this call, most of the work we do, we do in teams, so that matters. And at the same time, I can also find safety within myself that has nothing to do with how other people are treating me. 
And if anything, these two go together really well, because the more I can embody that safety in myself and be somebody who brings safety into the room, the easier it is for everybody else to meet me there. The easier it is for all of us to do the things together that create that emergent collective safety. So I want to explore this individual side of the team and individual co-creation of safety. And we know that rejecting fear doesn't help. So when I want to feel safe, pushing away everything inside me that doesn't feel safe is actually just more fear. Now it's just fear of my own fear. And maybe it stops me from being at my worst to squish it all down that way, but it doesn't elevate me up to being at my best. So what does? And it's this. That when I can love the fears, when I can love the heart that fears, when I can pull that in and hold it close and gently, not identifying with it, not wallowing in it, but really welcoming it as a beautiful part of being human, that makes it a lot easier to be at my best. I learned an important lesson on this from this guy, Matt Kapinas. He's a yoga instructor. And I used to go to his class and every single class he would say at some point, yoga is not about flexibility, it's about meeting your inflexibility with kindness. And he would say that and the whole room would sigh. <sighs> And everybody's hamstrings would get a little bit looser. Because when we meet that inflexibility with kindness, there's less to fight. There's less to hold on to. And suddenly we become more flexible. And I think that this is true about psychological safety as well. So I would say that transformational development or safety, I would play with the language of transformational safety, is not about being fearless. It's about meeting your fear with kindness. And that's courageous presence. That's a huge part of how each of us can be at our best more often. By meeting our own vulnerability, our own terror, our own fear, our own edginess with kindness. And then I find it really interesting that there are a lot of techniques in the world for how we do this. And Everyone on this call, I'm sure, has worked with people through this process in one way or another. My hope is to give you language for something you're already a little familiar with. But I've found that of all of the coaching methodologies I've encountered, there are three kind of fundamental underlying strategies of what do we do with fear once we've met it and held it and received it that disempowers it. So the fear isn't what's driving my choices anymore. And I call these three underlying strategies, recalibrating, excavating, and elevating. I'm going to say a word about each of them now, and we're going to get to experience a taste of each of them in just a moment. So recalibrating asks, what else is true? If fear puts blinders on me so that all I can see is a threat, just looking around and noticing that that's not the whole story is really helpful. Excavating asks, what pain is this fear protecting me from? And when I can make peace with that pain, when I can hold that pain loosely, then the fear is also enormously less powerful. The fear just doesn't have the same hooks in me when pain is just part of life. And elevating says, what good thing does this fear want for me? If it's trying to protect me from a threat, it's also trying to bring something good into my life. And if I can hold that as gusto, as a desire, rather than a fear, then I get to be bigger and I'm on an adventure. And this is nice to talk about. That's great. And it's a lot more interesting to experience. So I want to take us through just a little taste of each of these. In the spirit of, of exploring the territory and in the spirit of um, the more familiar we are with this in ourselves, the easier it is to show up to clients, the easier it is to show up to teams, the easier it is to meet other people's fears with enormous kindness because I'm not resisting that in myself. 
So as the slide says, if you would, please grab a notebook or a blank document on your laptop or whatever is going to be useful for you and call to mind a small challenge worth exploring. And I say small because we don't want to get into the biggest, thorniest, most terrifying thing in your life when I only have about 10 minutes for this reflection. But we can actually learn a lot from working with small fears. We can learn a lot from working with small stucknesses. And actually working with small stucknesses tends to give us a lot more room to breathe on the big stucknesses. So the first move I want to make is to have you picture someone who loves you, sitting with you and reflecting on this challenge and asking you what's at risk here. What might go wrong if this whole situation falls apart? And what would be so bad about that? And then what would be so bad about that? And you can keep plumbing this until you sense something shift. When I get down to, then I would be alone. Then I would be powerless. Something shifts in my body because now I know the real fear. So take a moment for that. What's really at risk? And when you feel something shift, give me a thumbs up or a nod or a wink. And when I see enough of those, I'll keep this going. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Santina. Thank you, Maribel. Thank you, Laurie. Okay. So we've got a sense of what's at risk and this is the thing to hold dearly. This is the thing to hug. If you've got me on gallery view, you can look at your screen and see a dozen other people who also have a vulnerable fear. So you're not alone in it. This is part of what it means to be human. There's nothing wrong with you for being vulnerable. There's nothing wrong with you for being afraid. And we can move through it. So we can do the recalibrating move of asking what else is true, because fear never tells us the whole story. And just looking at other parts of the story shifts our state and makes new things possible. So without denying the fear or making it wrong, you can don't do all of these, but you can tune into what's my purpose here that makes engaging this threat worthwhile? Or what's my track record here? When I've done this in the past, has it gone as badly as I would worry? Or has it usually gone better? What's funny about me worrying about this? Or just even my body and breath, where's the safety in this moment? Because the threat isn't here right now. And again, I'll give you a minute. Picture someone who loves you asking you these questions for about a minute and see what comes up. And that was a minute. And it might feel short. It's wonderful to come back to these later. Hopefully that's enough that you can feel a little bit of what does the shift feel like when I recalibrate? And recalibrating is excellent in the moment to pull you out of that tunnel vision that fear can create. It's of the three, the least transformative. You have to do a lot of reps recalibrating before the same fear stops grabbing you and derailing you. So it's nice to have other tools in your toolkit. Next, I wanna look at excavating. What pain is this fear protecting me from? We all learned fear by having painful experiences. But when you can honor that pain, the fear kind of metabolizes into grief, relief, and wise caution. There were moments as a kid that I wasn't held and loved in the way that I needed to be. And that has taught me to hold back sometimes from showing my full self to other people. That creates a fear in my life. 39 years old, I can hold that pain that six years old, I really couldn't. And it can move through my body in a cleaner way now than it could have been. And I can ask myself things like, what do I need to let go of? Maybe I need to let go of certainty, or I need to let go of impressing people, or I need to let go of having everything my way, right? And that lets me be with the pain. 
And then what becomes possible now? There's often relief in that. I might feel lighter. And what reasonable steps can I take? I think of this like buckling your seatbelt when you get in the car. You don't want to drive in vigilant terror of an accident, but you don't want to buckle your seatbelt. So again, we're going to take a generous, spacious minute and imagine someone who loves you asking you these questions. How does this feel different? I love excavating. I love it for myself. I love it with clients. I love the catharsis of it. And you've probably had these moments in your life or with clients where they can finally feel the grief that they've been holding back for years and let it go. And the world is a sunnier place and they feel lighter and new things are possible for them. And more shift happens in that one moment than in repetitions over and over of just recalibrating. It's great to know how to access this for yourself and for others. And elevating is going to feel really different. And again, I'm aware this is such short bites of each one. If this touches on something you want to explore more later on your own or with me, please do. Elevating tunes us into our own grandeur. It asks the question, what good thing does this fear want for me? When I get afraid of alienating other people, what I want is connection. And I want to be authentic in connection. And you can tune in, what need would I need to, what would I need to have not to be afraid? What good thing would I need? Or what resource does this fear assume is scarce? My fears often assume that goodwill is scarce in the world. And that tells me that I want goodwill. I want a lot of it. And then you can ask, what would it feel like to get everything I want? What would it be like if I could just scoop up all the goodwill from other people that my heart could ever want? And it feels great. And it makes me bigger. And when you tune into the gusto of that, that this isn't just a threat response pushing bad things away, it's also pulling in something good. It turns the threat into a thrill. So this is our last one. Take a moment for this too. Take about a minute. What wonderful thing is your tender fear trying to bring into your life? And how does it feel to want it audaciously? And I'm going to bring you back together. Thank you for following me through. I'll be honest, I've never tried to lead an experience of all three of these this condensed. And seeing the smiles and the emotions on your faces and the nodding that shows you're at least getting something out of each one, very gratifying to me. So thank you for that. And I want to turn to you now. What are your reflections on this? My hope is you felt something of that beauty of meeting your own fear with kindness. And my hope is that you felt a little bit of just the variety of these three different strategies, that energetically they feel different, they pull you in different directions. And I want to hear how that was for all of you. So thank you so much, Yotam, just to start with. That was very inspiring and moving personally. So who would like to share? I thought it was amazing, um, really touched uh, upon things that I know about myself and really surfaced it. And I was trying to uh, consider how this would work in a team setting. And I immediately went to a client that exactly this is what she needs. <laughs> and then how do we do this in a team setting, though, so that they all have this experience um, in, in this particular team is around accountability. So all that to say, this can, for me, it was so powerful in surfacing things that I usually, I try to hide. <laughs> and then I could imagine if this comes up in a team, the bonding and vulnerability and trust that that could create if we're allow, if, if they allow themselves to, to have this conversation, the learnings, the insights. I agree. It was, um, I, uh, I also love a lot of uh, being able to reflectively go through things. So this was fantastic. Um, and uh, I know one of the things it brought up for me is uh, one of the areas that uh, I've been getting personally a more uh, connected with is just 
about accepting without judgment. And I think that really helps in the, the process that you were just bringing through and uh, sort of reinforcing that. Um, and, you know, if we get to questions later, I think I have one that's similar as well. Um, I was wondering about uh, if you did something a bit deeper, how long do you typically do this over? Um, what would make, uh, or what have you found that's been effective? So thank you. Yeah, for me, uh, it just brought up the age old question of coaching therapy and, and reinforced for me the power of going deeper and not letting somebody else claim what should or shouldn't be coaching. And like, how can you not do this sort of work if this is what's at play? Yeah, yo, Tam, I, I really loved the twist of envisioning somebody who really loves you, mm. asking you the questions versus asking them myself to myself. So I put somebody in my lens and the whole thing shifted for me immediately because I, I could hear her soft spokenness. I could hear uh, her love for me, her tenderness. And it made the exercise much more accessible for me and gave it a really nice, uh, a really nice flavor. So thank you for that. Thank you for this, Yata. No, I, I loved the breaking it down into three different ways. Of here. And I felt like I got a really supportive nugget from from each one and it's great to think to feel in my body and psyche the depth of each one and to have a sense of like which tool I could bring out at any time based on how much time I have or time the client has um, or which pairs well with others and in what order so it's yeah thank you the process is so wonderful but I personally felt while facing a uh, deeper and deeper, deeper over my pain and the fear and the power of that deep fear was so strong that I couldn't read myself. If my um, action is based on that kind of a deep rooted um, threatening, like, a, like a existing some threatening fear, yeah. it is nice to say, okay, we can, yeah. or reorientate it's not something that can be direct directing in that way in you know, like a few sessions and in your own experience I want to hear like the painful cases that makes it more real first of all Grace thank you for sharing that and I see that that was hard and that you're holding yourself through it in a in a gentle way and i'm glad that you're able to do that we all have limits in how much we can handle of this kind of thing at once and uh, i i mentioned you know there's pain i couldn't handle at six years old that i can at 39 and there's pain i still can't handle at 39 that i hope i will at 50. so we want to be gentle with those limits that's actually also part of meeting ourselves with love meeting ourselves with kindness and the gentle exploration of how much can I breathe through, how much can I feel, is really valuable. As Alexander pointed out, picturing that person who loves you with you expands the, the hose a little bit so a little more can flow through. Doing this in person with someone who really does love you or a trained energy worker, as we were talking about, as people were coming onto the call can also expand the flow. There's a lot of ways that we can allow more pain to be digested. And in the meantime, we just all have to be compassionate with our own limits. You were asking about real stories and I don't wanna go into too much detail, but in, in my best coaching engagements, I've gotten to see clients not only move these things through themselves, but also really expand how much they can move these things through themselves so that there's a positive feedback loop. And that's just beautiful to get to witness. Jonathan, I, I loved your question about coaching and therapy. And I'll just say, I, I feel confidently that this is within the realm of coaching as long as you've been trained for it. And we all need to know our own capacity. In the same way as we know our own capacity for our inner work, 
We need to know our scope of practice in dealing with other people. I think this is inbounds for coaching if you're prepared. Let's talk about how this works on a team. I would not walk into a team day one. Let's all meet our fears with love in the first you know, 20 minutes of a team engagement. I think this is something we need to build up into. And intuitively, people really get the, um, the both and that we are responsible for one another's safety and we can't be fully responsible for one another's safety. It can't be my job to never activate your fears, but it can be my job to meet your fears with kindness when they arise. And it can be my job to show up to this team as cleanly as I can in how my fears come forward. So when you've built a bit of a container that a team is ready to be on a learning journey together, working like this can be a profound addition. So it might be really hard to talk about some of the particular points of conflict, but to say, okay, underneath that conflict, I'm a vulnerable human being and you're a vulnerable human being and I'm willing to care about you makes it easier for us to kind of sit on the same side of the table in the problems that we need to solve together. Moments I've seen where people who work together can name this is a core fear of mine. And because we're all doing it, it's safe to name it. Those are beautiful moments. People can feel so alone in their fears. And knowing that they're universal, knowing everybody on the team has their own version of something like this, it just makes all the work get easier. I have a question as a follow up to that. So at the beginning of this exercise, you asked us to think of a small challenge. So if we're doing this, and I agree in terms of the where in the journey, definitely needs to be. I'm curious, how do you pose that challenge question? Is it, do you, do we want to have them think about the common challenge that they share Mm. about their individual divisions or is it still a personal challenge? Very much a personal challenge. Yeah. Once you've explored it as personal challenges, you can bring it to the question of shared work, but this, the, the internal exploration is very personal. So, um, It can be what's a really low stakes challenge you're facing now where you're a little bit stuck because like on a call like this with a team, you don't want to push people into the deepest, hardest thing right away. It can also be, let's look at the past. When was a moment in the past when you were pretty derailed, when something really knocked you off center and what was going on there and mining that past experience in some ways can also be safer specifically for the excavating work. For recalibrating and for elevating, I think it's useful to work with something that still exists in the present because uh, those both point to a path forward. Um, I think you might've just started to address my question around the excavating piece. And Mm -hmm. I'm thinking a little bit more about one-on-one coaching here. Mm -hmm. You know, as if you're excavating pain the way that you help people metabolize that is probably nuanced, right? Between therapy yeah. and coaching, right? Therapy, you might be saying, hey, let's get into that. When did that happen? Who was there? You know, sort of unpacking the past as opposed to staying in the present. Yeah. Something like that. You know, that's where I'm. Ah, so how do we do that in a way that feels appropriate to coaching? Yeah. 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 There's interesting work going on that I'm not an expert in around how do you bring in someone's childhood story into a coaching context in a way that's safe and and responsible. Mm -hmm. And I I think that's a valuable exploration for us as a field. And if you're looking at it in the present, um, I find somatic work is often really valuable for this to say, what would it feel like if everything went bad? And can you breathe with that sensation? And notice that that sensation is uncomfortable, but you're not dying. Mm-hmm. And actually building the physical tolerance for the, the the physical sensation of the thing we're afraid of. Oh, suddenly I can breathe a lot deeper and I'm less constrained by my fears. Mm-hmm. You can also name sometimes without going into what was your family dynamic as a child, something like, 
when you were young, you probably genuinely couldn't handle this. And now that you're older, you can. And that's not, that that's a universal of human maturation. Mm-hmm. So that's safe, but it helps people notice I have a story that I can't handle this, but that story is outdated. I wanted to follow up on the exchange you just had with Maribel. Um, I, I, you know, I, I do wonder about the application of this work to what might be a collective fear in a team. Beautiful. Something that is held unconsciously by the team, by all members as a norm. You know, for example, the fear of making a mistake. Mistakes mm. are bad. Mm. Uh, mistakes will cost you your job. Decision-making is risky. And, I, and I'm and i wondering about these three strategies in accessing and working through a collective. So maybe for further work, we'd love to work with you on it, but I yeah. guess I can see the application there too, maybe. Yeah. So there's two really interesting things you, you touched on, I think, that are adjacent to each other. Right. So one is when everybody on the team shares a certain kind of fear, there can be beautiful bonding in each working that together. Right. And I also want to hold on to the possibility that my fear of making a mistake is actually a little different from your fear of making a mistake. And let's not confound them. There's also something really rich that I've never explored before that I love that you're pointing to, which is what are the collective fears about the team messing something up? And how do we hold those? Because the hope is shared and the fear is shared, how can the, the meeting it with kindness journey be shared? And I, I've never explored that overtly, but I think it would be really interesting to explore that overtly. It would. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Alexander. I just want to call out something that Jonathan put in the chat that I thought was just so beautiful um, in that he said, you know, that it's really courageous to share in a group that I'm having a different experience than what I'm hearing from others. Mm. There's, that was that's just so powerful. Oh, there's a lot of good stuff here in the chat and I'm not catching yeah, all of it. Sorry, there am I. Uh, I do want to pick up, uh, I see a reference here, Jonathan, to immunity to change. And I, I see immunity to change as really a classic calibrating strategy. And my wish is that the people teaching immunity to change would also bring in a little bit more room for some of the excavating and the elevating. And oh, and Jonathan, you have your hand up. So if there's another, yeah, I just wanted to build on that because historically there's this little worry box that wasn't even in the original map, and 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 I think that and they realized like we're missing something, but it's still this little box. But now that it's more okay to talk about emotions in coaching Mm -hmm. work, I think that we can talk about the fears, whether it's at an individual level or at a team level. And, and, and that's what really drives it. That's the elephant versus the rider. Mm. And, and so that's where I think there's even more overlap in a certain version of immunity to change work because it's all about like, well, what do you worry would happen if you did this thing you say you want? Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. And I just wanna um, highlight a particular piece that the discourse has shifted Really, over the last few years, there's so much more room to talk about this with clients. And I want all of us to have the courage to have these conversations with clients because most of them are ready now. They might not have been five years ago. Thank you, John. And unfortunately, our time is coming to a close. So first, I want to give an open up for everybody to come off mute for a minute and give Yotam a round of applause. Uh, I, I'm going to make a short plug. If you'd Please. like to explore more of this with me, I'm yes. teaching a class starting in September. Oh, that's pretty cool. I would love to have you there. And Corentus people are my people. I don't want to be making a quick buck from you. So there's a discount code in the chat. And if you need a further discount than that, please reach out to me. Yes, please, everyone, take a moment to click on that. And it's, I highly, highly recommend it. And with that... Alexander, give you one minute to take us out in a coherence moment. Yeah, sure. So as we always like to do, let's always take a moment to close our eyes and to do a proper incubation of the session. So this is a time 
eyes closed or open, whatever you prefer, but just to reflect upon two questions, really. What did I learn today? What was my learning today? So let those thoughts appear in your mind. What's the insight from today's session? And then the second question is, what's one thing you're walking away with? Concrete, tangible, practical that you can use in your life. Okay, Janice, back to you. So thank you, Yotam. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being here. Happy transition to the rest of your day and into a glorious weekend.